Let's get this Tuesday started. Uh, good morning, Melissa. Hello, how are you? I am doing great. Um, long Labor Day weekend. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah and I were just saying it got really creepy dark this morning um, mm -hmm. on the drive into work. So if you're driving into work, oh, that was a thing. Um, it was a real interesting <laughs> thing. So anyway, Sarah. Yeah, I'm, that's a good segue. We just, right. Melissa, thank you so much for being with us here today. We've been excited to talk to you for a couple of weeks and glad you were able to hop out of your other stuff and show up today. So thank you for that. Um, for those of you who don't know Melissa, she is the Director of Innovation at CISA 3 and also one of our West Ham board members, been with us for a couple of years now. Um, Melissa, could you tell us a little bit about what you do before we launch into our questions for you? Yeah, so basically I am on a constant quest for um, making technology really support learning. And I always lead with learning and not with technology, but I definitely think technology impacts learning and can absolutely enhance learning. Um, so I'm just always on the constant quest to make sure that we can simplify things um, for the benefit of learning and for the ease of learning. And so I try to make those things happen in real life for the teachers and the leaders that I serve in CISA 3 and then also just, you know, my audience in the Twitter world and Instagram and Facebook, all of those good places too. Anything on TikTok yet? You know, I can't get myself there. <laughs> However, I have a TikTok person that you need to check out. Her, I actually don't know who she is, but I'm going to find it and send the link for Sarah. But she's Miss <laughs> Connie. <laughs> Miss Connie is, um, she's a young actress who has taken on the persona of the school secretary who helps kids with everything. And she helps kids feel like they belong there. And, and it's a regular occurring segment on her TikTok page. And Miss Connie, we want every school sec school to have a Miss Connie because she's outstanding. Her character is beautifully designed and executed and that I've only seen it. So I've seen her on TikTok, but I have not produced my own TikTok. <laughs> I've tried. I don't get there's still time. There's still time. And, there's still time. And you know, Instagram Reels is the TikTok. And I really I like I look at that and I'm like, I really think I should try this some other day. Because I don't get it yet. <laughs> So, Here, here's the I'm perfect at. here's the perfect TikTok audio bit to I go with. So much stuff I should probably do today, but I don't want to do today. So let's make that future me's problem. <laughs> that is just Can right at my fingertips. That. That's right at my fingertips on the soundboard here. I listen to um, it like ten times a day. <laughs> ten or fifty, just on repeat. Yeah. It's all okay. Even it. my kids know it now. <laughs> 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 um, yes. No, I, okay. Off of TikTok for a little bit. Um, back to, to tell us a little bit, um, uh, for people that don't know, tell us a little bit about CISA three, uh, you know, geography, where we're at. Let's pretend that this isn't a bunch of people from Wisconsin that even understand right. what a CISA is. Right. So CISA is a regional service agency. And in Wisconsin, we have 12 of them. And basically what that means is the people in my agency serve, numerous schools in a variety of capacities. I always think of what we do at CISA as expanding the capacity of individual districts. Um, in CISA 3 specifically, I serve 31 rural school districts. Our largest district has just, just over 1,300 students and our small K-12, pre-K-12, and our smallest district is in the 350 student range in that pre-K through 12 um, district level two. So very rural community, um, very ag-based, but also lots of manufacturing in our region as well. Um, Land's End is probably one of our biggest employers. Um, and we're also in the southwest corner of Wisconsin. Yeah. Excellent. 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 Um, <laughs> Tell us here. We're now. I, I don't see. I get to start a school year all wrong because it's it's all over the place. 
Um, where are, where are your schools generally at? Or if you want to talk about your your own kids and all of that other stuff, mm-hmm. um, how's how's how are things taking shape right now? Are we too early yet to to say whether this is working or not? Or uh, t- tell us what your tell us what the schools in your area are are doing. Yeah, let's start. Let's start there. Online, offline, yeah. both hybrid, this, that, or the other, because it's very, very, very different in very different communities. It is. It's different across the state, um, but in our region, we definitely are seeing the majority of schools being back face to face for five days a week, okay. and um, lots of different ways to approach that within each of those systems. Um, Everybody, obviously, with the mask mandate from the governor is wearing masks, although prior to that mask mandate, I'm not sure that would have been the case. Um, That was seeming to be um, in watching. So one of the new developments, I love watching school board meetings. Um, (laughs) I know that sounds really ridiculous. Uh, However, I do enjoy seeing how the politics shape up in different districts that I serve. And I would say had the mask mandate not come into place from the governor, that that would have been a contentious piece um, from the all the way mm-hmm. through. Um, so with the governor putting the mask mandate in place, that sort of just shaped up the what that would look like. We do have just a few schools that are doing the hybrid, um, you know, two days on, three days off, online learning on the middle day or whatnot. Um, so we have a, a few schools with the hybrid and um, I don't know that we have any that are virtual, 100% virtual in our region. Um, having said that, I would say that all of the staff has been in, in our region, all of the teachers have been encouraged to design as if um they could be virtual at any given moment. And I will say, and I hope that I get a chance to talk about this, but I will say that uh, all of our schools have the option for online virtual learning um, if parents or students wanted that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that just uh, helps kind of set the playing field here because again, it, it's, it's, it's different. It's different between every school district. And uh, for instance, you know, Dane County, which is, you know, we're, we're bordering right next to Southwestern Wisconsin. I mean, you, I'm about an hour away, two hours away mm-hmm. um, from where you're at. And right now um, Dane County is in a position. This is, this is some news of last week. Um, Dane County's in a position where schools can open face to face for only K through two. And they published numbers late last week that if the number of cases in Dane County goes above 54 new cases per day over the last two weeks, they, that would signal to them. It's probably time to shut that down. Mm-hmm. And between the time they like got the data and published the report, that number jumped from 45, which was okay. It's okay for K2 uh, to today where now it's like 76, 78. Um, so, you know, the people in the background right now, even for the limited opening in K2 that we're, we're experiencing people in the background are having to make some decisions probably today or tomorrow about where things go. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, how, that's just how quick, this thing can turn from right. Well, we're all good. We're all together too. We're all online. Yeah. So that's interesting though. Um, because in Grant County, which is one of the counties that I'm serving, um, we had, uh, something like 19 cases, 13 cases, 17 cases in the last few days. Um, they've been above the 10 mark, which is a lot for our rural area. We, our county is geographically vast. You know, it's a lot of square miles. Um, but I'm not sure that that those numbers are having any bearing on I'm sure that school officials are thinking about them and and planning and adjusting. But I think that the shutting school down or moving to an all virtual scenario will come in our region, at least based specifically on numbers 
in school or among the staff. We did have one school delay a start date because of several staff members being on quarantine and not being able to um, obtain enough subs to get the year started. That's going to be a tricky one in there. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that get, getting mm-hmm. subs in a normal, normal, normal time is is di- quite difficult. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I haven't heard of any. I haven't heard of any huge outbreaks in schools yet to the point where they have to close them down. Broadhead. I, Broadhead. Broadhead okay. was on Channel Fifteen last week or last night, actually. Um, they have seven positive cases and their county officials are treating it as an outbreak. And it happened uh, in a party before school started, right? Lots of kids getting together before they're kicking off the year. And so there is technically, so they went all 100% virtual today. Um, and the kids went home Friday thinking they'd be going back to school today. So th- I think we'll see things like that pop up in the news. The impact that that will have on the neighboring districts, you know, this is where you can see if the quarantining um, really has an impact. And I, I think that you'll see that it does, which means schools will be in flux throughout the year. You know, they could be virtual at any given moment and back in class at any given moment. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things we've we've been talking a little bit with Kurt Kiefer at the DPI, and, and his word for it is open and close, and open and close, and open and close, because mm-hmm. uh, that's what that's what we have to kind of start wrapping our minds around is how mm-hmm. do you reopen and reclose, and and how do you and make I those think decisions? What, right, and I think what results from that is a really getting clarity around the benefit of being in the building versus the benefit of being in an at-home or a remote learning environment. So we have to get really clear. So if we want to make sure that kids are going to want to always come to school, we have to get really clear on the benefit of being in that physical space. And that's going to take, I think that that's where the rethink comes. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's also the perfect. And and you mentioned, Melissa, that you want to talk about, you know, the, the online learning piece. So so roll with that. Just go with it. But um, what do you think we need more clarity about in all of this? Like, I love the word rethink. Um, it's different than clarity, but those two things are definitely related. Mm-hmm. Can you Can you speak to your thoughts on that right now? Yeah, I think we need to really think about, and this will lead right into my thoughts on, um, the virtual options that we have. Um, So the clarity comes with everybody knows. So every, the political stance is divided in terms of, should we go back to school? What is the benefit? um, Or should we stay home and keep everybody safe? Well, I of course want everybody to be safe, but in my own experience, I'm less worried about my children getting COVID than having a crappy experience at school. Um, and the reason I say that is because we're rushing to go back to normal and what we're sending back, back, sending kids back to is anything but normal. Um, you know, we're in masks all day, which is certainly for their health benefit. Um, my own child came home the second day of school crying because, and he's a seventh grader, but he was in trouble uh, four of the six hours of his day because his he has a breathing issue. He has like he cannot breathe through his nose ever. Like this is not a new thing. <laughs> but <laughs> but I didn't actually think it was that big of a deal. Like you know. But he was so upset because he was in trouble every single hour. So what resulted was I ended up getting a doctor's excuse um, for him to wear his mask below his nose. He's still wearing the mask, but below his nose. And that made a huge difference. But his relationship with those teachers who who were correcting him was immediately impacted. They didn't know this, but internally that was impacted for him. And, um, So I think, you know, we're definitely not going back to normal. The cafeteria scene is interesting. The friendship and the social pieces of what school is really intended to be is interesting. It's different. It's not bad. I mean, my kids have not complained. I haven't heard other kids complaining. They enjoy being with 
people, um, even in these, even in this way. Um, but at the same time, I think that we have to rethink the experience and really get clear on what, what the goal is when they're physically together in a physical building. Because if they can get the same thing through their learning management system or, you know, a Zoom meeting or a video conference meeting, and they don't need to physically be in the building. When it's hunting season, my oldest is going to be really thinking hard <laughs> about whether or not he needs to go physically to the building. Um, but what our region is doing that causes me great concern is that the virtual option for my children was learning online in a video conference room like this from first hour till eighth hour, yeah. eight o'clock in the morning till three o'clock in the afternoon. And to be honest, I don't know that that's a choice. It feels a little coercive. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to have to deal with you people online. So we're <laughs> going to make it really hard for you to enjoy that experience. But you have to be here for attendance. It's really stress, stressful and it's really not great pedagogy. So from a mom and from an instructional designer and an instructional trainer and supporter and professional development person, I'm like, oh, my heart, it's causing me a huge panic attack all the way around. And yet it's the solution people are finding to be the easiest to implement. Yeah, I, that that makes me kind of shudder when I've seen some examples of, okay, just turn the computer on and live stream the classroom and uh, just like, oh, I know. Oh, and that's happening. Yeah. And the amount yeah. of money, the amount of money we've invested into the hardware to make live streaming um, full days of courses is is very interesting to me as well. Yeah, for for my kids, um, I've got I've got one um, right now that's in tenth grade. Uh, you know, all virtual online um, in this case, and it seems like you know they they started out last week, kind of dipping their toes in it, um, and then thankfully it's not a you know all day every day online mm -hmm. do that. Um, you know, the 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 teachers in the district have kind of figured out that you know we'll generally try and get the the kids online synchronously in the afternoons um, for the high school students. Um, we'll kind of go through a, a class schedule type of thing. We'll leave the Wednesdays free and open for individual small group stuff. We'll leave the mornings available for teachers to touch base with the students. And, you know, just based off of, you know, whatever, three days worth of experience, it seems to be um let's say more structured than what we were in last spring mm -hmm. um uh in and, and a little bit more i'll say rigorous i guess um mm -hmm. than then it was you know when it was just kind of an emergency and what are we going to do about this right. um i don't know how long that's going to last uh, but the yeah. largest Lars is enjoying it um mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't think having more structure compared to what we had in the spring is a bad idea. I think it's a matter of providing more structure for the masses yeah. um, all at one time because you're trying to do face-to-face -face and virtual simultaneously. And I think when we think about one of the most important pieces about um, being in school um, one of the most important pieces for our kids is to feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that kids in the classroom and kids online can simultaneously belong to something. What are we doing to create the container in which kids belong to when we are online video conferencing and, you know, in person at large? So I, I just think the container isn't set up to, we don't know what we belong to. And we're trying to belong to the same thing, which is not a whole lot different than what it was before. It's just, I, I'm here and you're there, but then that changes the nature of community. So it just changes the nature of what we belong to. 
Okay, so now I'm going to pick on your experience outside of like trying to figure this out for South or Western Wisconsin today. Mm -hmm. Do you have some good examples of online containers in which you belong? I, I'm really interested in this online mm -hmm. community stuff, how it works, right. and things like that. Um, that's sort of what we're we're, we're aspiring to here as well is give people a, a place um, to get together mm -hmm. and just talk with each other given the circumstances that we have. Wisnet, we've done face-to-face -face stuff a lot um, and, and we're mm -hmm. comfortable with that. You know, we, we've done a lot of work to do that and now we can't. So how do right. we build that container where people can feel like they belong um, to something? Um, and I know, I know, I know we've had these discussions a lot. I've got a couple of those in my life, but what what what's an example of a good one that you've had or good experience mm -hmm. you've had online? Well, first of all, let's. I think that it's important that we start with giving some of the things that have happened in the state of Wisconsin over the last twenty five years some credit. We have had um, Don Nordine at season nine has been leading the Wisconsin Digital Learning Collaborative for, over, I mean, if it's not 20 years, it's right around there. And that has been um, creating a container for asynchronous online learning for 20 years. And I'm just not sure um, to what extent that statewide resource has been utilized in planning for what we're experiencing now. And she's a wealth of knowledge and her team, she and her team and all of those people that have been working with her for the past 20 years are a wealth of resource. And we should be definitely checking out what's happening in that space collectively. It is, it's been funded, greatly funded by the state. And it's one of those resources that we should, in this moment, at least attempt to be maximizing. But in terms of just online communities, I think that there's a lot to be learned from um, online community building. And there's a lot of research out there. I belong to an organization called CMX, which is basically a professional organization for community builders, online community builders. It is a profession that is... Um, it's definitely growing in scope. And in the midst of COVID, community managers have now become CEOs of community, right? There's now like a career path for community management. But what they're really good at doing is defining the space like we talked about. And one of the people that I've been following online and following her work um, and actually an organization is the community colleges in California um, and specifically Fabiola Torres, T-O-R-R-E-S. She um, is using a tool called Pronto and it's pronto.io. And basically it functions like a closed Facebook messenger and it allows you to send text, send audio, send video, attach documents, etc. And so what she said is it does not replace her learning management system. Um, in her particular case, Pronto lives inside of Canvas, which is her learning management system. It's like an API integration. So it kind of sits inside of Canvas, but it also functions as an app on her phone and the student's phone. And so um, attendance is sort of uh, not mandatory, but like attendance is the benefit, right? Like the experience of being together is the benefit. But if it can't happen, she tr she does a really good job of connecting with her students through video and audio through Pronto. And it's not like lectures. It's like, hey, thought of you. I read this article and I think it would let match with this thing that we read in class for today. Here's the link if you want to check it out. But tell me what tell me where you're at. What are you reading? And it's something that simple, but it gets the, the students engaging with each other and her. And that video component is a super humanizing piece for building that, um, that human connection, even when you're in an asynchronous space. In fact, um, California Community Colleges did a three-day challenge on humanizing your course. And 
none of those colleges, those community colleges are um, in face to face at all right now. So they're all struggling to feel how to figure out how to humanize that learning experience, because we all know learning is automatic, natural and social. So if you don't have that social component, there's not that connection to making that important. But um, that three-day humanized challenge is really interesting, and I'm going to definitely pull from that work in some of the work that I'll be doing and leading teachers through this year, too, because it's just fabulous. What does your year look like? Do you you know yet? (laughs) Um. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting. It's really re- forcing service agencies to rethink our support model without yeah. a doubt. Um, but it's also giving us an opportunity to to show people that um, we can be a resource. So, you know, we're my specific projects um, at our CISA are connected to technology. So we have a digital collaborative and basically people, when we partnered with ISTE um, for their, um, their, oh God, I can't remember, the Pathways project. So we partnered with ISTE for their Pathways coursework, which is about five to seven hours on three different courses as the base of what we wanted everybody to start with. And it very much aligns to the Wisconsin, um, the Wisconsin ITL standards. And so we felt like they were very much aligned. But then basically, everything that somebody asks us to do, we design it as if it was going to be um, consumed asynchronously at any point in time. And we're building the repository of training in our learning management system, which in our region, either people use Schoology or Google Classroom. Um, But we put everything in Schoology and so people can get it when they need it. And then we're doing a lot of educating through a weekly newsletter, which actually will just start this week. And basically that weekly newsletter will sort of recap where we are, share a quick tip, and then drive them back to the resources that are there so that they are always aware that there's this on-demand library. And that weekly email and newsletter will also help give people permission to reach out, right? Like if... They might be thinking about something in a meeting they have with a colleague or they're working with a student and there's a problem they're trying to solve and they think, oh, well, I'll reach out to Missy. And then they don't until I show up in their email and now they can respond and say, hey, I was thinking about this. And so it's just being um, more predictably present. That's the language I'm using, predictably present. I like that. My last question. Sarah might have some more, but what are you doing outside of um, all of this stuff now to keep yourself uh, occupied, (laughs) sane, Mm -hmm. Um, keeping the knife sharp there, whatever, however you want to put it. Um, What what are you doing? Yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, So I'm a learner, and that's what I like to do that sort of calms my brain from Um, I can easily get into teaching mode um, very, very quickly, but I really find a lot of peace and calm when I'm actually the learner. So in the midst of last spring, when it was wildly crazy, (laughs) (laughs) I was a little bit video fatigued, let me tell you. Um, And so I actually went to a day long online conference that CMX, the community organization that I belong to, was hosting. And they hosted it on a new platform called Hopin. And that particular online conference venue blew my mind. It changed my entire experience of that day. And while it is still video conferencing, it's a much more robust um, experience. So I actually have been looking, I, I've been working with Hopin just from a, like reading their blogs and learning about how they are designing events um, and de- designing a, a tool that will change the event, the online event experience. And um, so I've been really studying that and really thinking about how we can change video conferencing. Now, don't take my Zoom away. 
this is very practical <laughs> and I love it. And I was, yeah. I have been using Zoom since 2015. So I feel like it's the, an old school thing, but it's tried and true and don't ever take it away from me. But you I change am it every start- week. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, security it's been the fun is, one for me. That's yeah. The security fun. one's been, the security of it has been changing, which is good. But yes. yes. Um, Ultimately, like I'm just looking at, um, have I've read the book Priya Parker wrote called The Art of Gathering. Yeah, super. Everybody should read that book right now. And even though it's a, it's a book about in person gatherings, the same thinking can be applied to teaching and learning in this time period, whether we're face to face or online. And so I would say that really kind of digging into that um, and learning and just rethinking and sort of giving myself the time and space to think about that is actually contributing to my calm because I can get wrapped up into all these decisions that people are making and the thing, the work that the minutia of the work that they have to do. But I'm literally at an agency, a a professional development agency, because I'm supposed to be thinking ahead. And so I'm giving myself the time and the space to do that and trying not to add another voice to what's happening in the schools. They have enough people telling them, (laughs) you could do this, you should do this, you whatever. They kind of need somebody to chart the path and show them how something is different. And essentially, that's what I find a lot of calm in doing. So that's what I'm doing in terms of like my own mental health and taking care of myself that way. I really have gotten really good at blocking my calendar and knowing what I'm going to do every day and what I'm not going to do every day and making a list. And if it has to go to next week, just being straight up honest, like that's going to get done next week and really trying to take care of that. So, but yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm going straight to that art gathering book to reread it probably for the third time right now in this context. Because yeah. Actually, if you just read her blog, like okay. her, she just had a recent newsletter. This is a really pertinent right now because, you know, obviously Wisconsin is, has our um, issues with race and we're quite divided and we have a lot of work to do as a state and as an education system. But she wrote two newsletter articles back-to-back weeks on the mute button. And the mute button is a way to exercise power and to create sterile environments. And you know what? Dang it, I'm not going to use that mute button. I will ask people to make their judgment about using their own mute button, but I am going to avoid using it on people and exercising my power that way. And that is something that... Let me tell you, people in this world are not considering. They think nothing of just muting somebody. But the implications of that could essentially become much larger. So reader newsletter, get on that list. She writes awesome stuff every week. I I second that. She also had a really incredible um, article in New Yorker back in April about how how we're gathering digitally. And even like since April, things have changed. But I have a friend who has attended like three zoom funerals for family members since COVID began and just like experiencing how we're together online and go through these, like not even just working or going to school, Mm -hmm. but how, how we're, how we're doing all of our like cultural and social rituals. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. Pretty Parker's amazing. I, mean, I went to job yeah. last year, the year before, and I was like, read this book right now. <laughs> it's so good. It is really good. Um, she actually had a, a podcast, too, um, yeah. right there that she partnered with the New York Times to do. And it's called, I'm looking, um, Together Apart. And it's done in conjunction with the New York Times, but it's Priya Parker together apart. And it's fantastic. She really, you know, just listening to her will help you rethink and find clarity around um, the gathering. So it's fantastic. Have you read um, How We Show Up by Mia Birdsong? No, I'm writing it down. In the same vein, um, the subtitle is Reclaiming Family, Friendship, and Community. And it's um, it's a little bit different than Priya Parker's work, but basically um, Mia Birdsong talks about um, how important it is that we 
that we literally like show up for each other and do the work together and not, not just exclusively around, um, you know, like race relations in this country, but just how we are together socially and as professionals together. And it, it like, sometimes books are just soulmates. And I think like how we show up is the art of gathering soulmate. Um, if you're wanting more in that vein, it's really, really good. I read it out a couple months ago. Awesome. I'm buying it. <laughs> I trust you, Sarah. I totally trust your judgment. <laughs> Thank you. Another a short library list. Minute. So I appreciate um, it. There you go. Sarah, do you have anything else? Any other thoughts? No, I no. I think this is good. I, I don't have anything else right now. And I've got some things to do, you know, the, 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 got, got, got a whole list of fun things to do this week here. Um, yeah. So awesome. I'm, I'm going to go out and re-download or re-buy that, that Priya Parker book. I'll send remember. you a link, John. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you close her up, Sarah? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. Um, again, Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. It's always great to talk to you. Um, for those of you who have joined us, thanks a lot. Um, so it's nice to have you here with us. We are going to continue this series, um, hopefully weekly, as fall and winter continue. Our guest next week is, um, um, so I'm blanking, Sarah Lipke from, from CISA 10. Um, and you can go and visit this, if you want to revisit this video or any of our past shows, that's at wisnet.net forward slash events. And that is also the address where you'll, you'll find, um, registration for our upcoming shows and a form for you to fill out. If you'd like to suggest guests for us or topics that you'd like to see covered, we would really love your input because John and I don't have a year's worth of ideas <laughs> so we'll, anyway, make, wants... we'll make it happen winter is coming yeah. well yes winter is coming always it starts <laughs> in like june winter is coming um so anyway uh if you guys want to want to help us out give us some feedback in that respect we really appreciate it and other than that i think that's it we're also kind of working in the background a bit on what those containers of belonging mean yeah. Um, with some other, with a few other ideas, uh, we're just getting the use to this and the production of this, but uh, a few of the other tricks up our sleeves that'll come out in the next couple of weeks. So watch for that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. You too. Good. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>